Hi, welcome to Office Hours. My name is Patrick Curran, and along with Dan Bauer, we make up Curran Bauer Analytics. In this episode of Office Hours, I want to talk about how we can estimate growth curve models within a multi-level modeling framework. In a prior episode, I talked about what is growth curve modeling more generally and how does it compare to more traditional methods. And here I'd like to talk about, well, we actually have data and we want to fit a model. How do we do that within a multi-level modeling framework? In another video, I'll explore the same question, but how do we go about doing that within a structural equation modeling framework? So to begin, I want to jump back briefly to some conditions that we assume to exist in our general linear model. So t-test, ANOVA, multiple regression, standard structural equation model. And what we have is we believe there to exist some population, right? And it's often considered infinite population. Maybe it's countable, but we assume it's an infinite population. And from that, we randomly sample individual observations. So for an example, I'll talk about children and development of aggressive behavior, but it can be any unit of analysis. It can be any outcome. And so we have individual, we'll say I, one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so we randomly draw six individuals. Now we do that for several hundred individuals. And then say we fit a multiple regression model and we want to map on some dependent variable to the optimal linear combination of our set of predictors, just a usual regression. One of the key assumptions that we make is independence. And what that says colloquially is that no two randomly selected observations are going to be any more or less similar than any other two. Now, technically, this assumption applies to the residuals of the regression equation, but for, for purposes here, we can talk about the individuals themselves is that if I randomly picked two and I randomly picked another two, that there would be no systematic difference in the relation, as no two would be any more related than any other two. However, what if we have some kind of nesting structure in the data? That is that there's a hierarchical or a nested structure in which some of the observations are more or less related, they are more related than other observations. Well, how might that come about? Well, imagine instead of selecting six individuals, we selected six classrooms, all right? So we have now the population is a population of classrooms, and we have randomly selected six of those. Then within each classroom, let's say that we randomly select three kids, all right? So we have one, two, three, and so on. We have three kids in each class. All right, so we have six classrooms, three kids per class. We have a total sample size of 18 kids. So here we'll say kids. Now let's ask ourselves at the level of the kid, does that assumption of independence hold? That is, are any two kids any more or less similar than any other two kids? Well, in this situation is very probably so, because if we select two kids who share a classroom, they're going to be much more similar to one another than two children who are drawn from different classrooms. And this is really the cornerstone of the multi-level model, is there's a two-stage sampling where we have what are sometimes called level one units. That's our kind of lowest order unit, the children that are nested within classroom, and then level two groupings. All right, so classroom here would be the level two. Now, as I'll talk about in a few moments, this is the multi-level model is extremely well set up to move to level three or to level four, and we can talk about that more in just a few minutes. So how do we make use of this for repeated measures data? Well, a really remarkable characteristic of this model is we can keep exactly the same structure as we have before, but now imagine instead of kid nested within classroom, we have repeated observations nested within kid. All right, so this is still going to be our level two, all right, but now it's kid. So we randomly sample from a population, and we get here in the schematic six children. But on each of those kids is we now have time, or age, or assessment, or whatever our metric is. So now, 
I'm kid one, and I have three repeated observations. You're kid two, and you have three repeated observations. Notice it's exactly the same design as we had before. And now we can again ask ourselves, well, we have 18 person time observations. Are they independent? Of course not because my observations are going to be more related to one another given that they were drawn from me than my first observation and your first observation which are across individuals so we have nested structure and so we're going to use this framework to map our repeated measures onto the passage of time we're going to treat it as a simple nesting problem so to do that we are going to begin to write out some basic equations to link our repeated measure to the passage of time. So the example I used in a prior video and the data set that we have online, if you want to uh, look at real data with uh, a different code that we've uh, provided, is it's the development of aggressive behavior in kids. And so we have a large sample of children. They range from age six up to 14. And we're interested in individual variability and developmental trajectories of aggressive behavior. That is, where do they start? Where do they go? So we can start by writing an equation at level one. Remember, this is going to be at the level of the nesting within kid. And so we're going to have aggressive behavior at time point t for individual i. So there's the nesting, t within i. And the aggressive behavior for any given kid, for me, for you, the aggressive behavior for any given kid is going to be beta naught sub i. That's going to be their individual specific intercept of their trajectory. Plus beta 1 sub i times, say, age, t sub i. So this is the slope. That's going to be the slope of the trajectory. Um, as a function of the numerical value of age at time t, and then plus residual, ti, that distance between our observed repeated measure and the underlying trajectory. Now, as I described in an earlier video, what this maps onto is if we have age and aggressive behavior, is I'm going to use my repeated measures that were obtained on me to get an estimate of this beta naught sub i, which, if we rescale age to start at zero, is going to be the model implied values of aggressive behavior at the starting point of the trajectory. And then we're going to have beta 1 sub i, which is going to be the rise over run. It's just the linear slope of my trajectory. All right, And then the residual is going to be the distance of each of my observed values from my underlying trajectory. So what we've been able to do is map our aggressive behavior on to the passage of time here that is scaled as age, and we get an estimate of my individual intercept, my individual slope. We get an estimate of your individual intercept, your individual slope. We're going to do that for the entire sample. All right, but remember, we have another level of structure in the data. We have level two. So we can write a level two equation, and actually it becomes a set of equations, is we believe that these beta naught sub i and beta 1 sub i vary randomly over individual. So there's individual variability in starting point, there's individual variability in rate of change over time. So we can write an equation for each of those. So we can say, all right, beta naught sub i is going to be some mean, gamma naught naught, plus some random component, u naught sub i. So these are all the individual intercepts and we can break them down into the overall mean intercept. This is the fixed effect. And then the distance of each kid's intercept from the mean, that's the random effect. We can have beta 1 sub i is gamma 1 naught plus u 1 sub i. And that's going to be the same thing for fixed slope, the overall mean. And then the deviation for this kid from the mean, that's the random effect. So what are these fixed effects here. Well, let's go back to that plot where we have age and aggressive behavior, and this is going to be gamma naught naught, the average starting point. This is going to be gamma one naught, the average rate of change over time. Those are the fixed effects. Those are the fixed components of the trajectory, the average trajectory. Now remember, we have a whole set of individual trajectories around that. And the deviation 
of each trajectory, both from the overall intercept and the overall slope, are going to be captured in these random effects. So these are fixed, these are random. Well, what do we do with those random? How do those enter the model? Well, we don't actually estimate the u's and zeros and the u1s during the estimation process. We can, we can get estimates for those, but it's not part of the estimation of the model. But what we do get are estimates of the variance of u0 sub i, the variance of u1 sub i, and the covariance between u0 and u1. And these are often referred to as tau naught naught, tau one one, and tau one naught. This is literally the elements from a variance covariance matrix among the random effects. Tau naught naught is the variance in the starting point, tau one one is the variance in the rate of change over time, and tau one naught is the covariance between the two. And so that is, on average, is there a linear association between where you start and where you go over time. So these are variants of the random effects. These are the fixed effects, the gamma naught naught and the gamma one naught. So that builds the fundamental part of the growth model within the multi-level framework, is we have a level one that's within KID, we have a level two that is between KID. As I mentioned in a prior video, this actually highlights the term that we often get in growth models that is examining inter-individual differences in intra-individual change. Level one captures intra-individual change, that is within person change as a function of the growth trajectory. Level two captures inter-individual differences in these u naughts. that is how different am I and are you from those overall mean levels and how large is that when we pool over everybody in the sample. All right. In the literature, this is sometimes called an unconditional model in that there are predictors in it. This is a little bit of a misnomer because, of course, age is a predictor in the model, right? We literally have a numerical value of age. We have a numerical value of aggressive behavior in our data file, and we are mapping aggressive behavior onto age. But often the term unconditional is there aren't any predictors beyond the age variable. Well, how would predictors enter into this model? Well, let's start with level two, right? Because that's the between kid model, the inter-individual differences. So what we want to examine is, let me just lose this and I'll rewrite it, is we have our beta knots and our beta ones, right? And we always have gamma naught naught, and we always have gamma one naught. Those are the fixed effects. And then let's say, as a very simple example, we're interested in the role of gender in the prediction of the, the intercepts and slopes. So we want to know, are there differences between boys and girls in where they start in aggressive behavior, where they go over time? So we can literally bring, as a predictor into our model, gender at level two. So we can have gamma not one gender sub i plus u not sub i, and we can have gamma one one gender sub i plus u1 sub i. All right, now there are a couple of changes to the model here. What we've done is we are looking for now shifts in the mean of the trajectory. All right, before the unconditional model, there was just one starting point and one rate of change over time. All right, as for all of this example, we have age and aggressive behavior. But now what we want to know is maybe there's a trajectory that's unique to boys that starts higher and increases more steeply than that that's compared for girls. So you see that there's a shift, there would be a positive effect here on the intercept if we had girl coded zero and boy coded one, is that there's an increment to the intercept of the trajectory for boys, and then if this were positive, that would be an increment to the slope in saying we now have a conditional model. You can see now the term of unconditional means no predictors. Conditional is we're conditioning the intercepts and slopes on information that we have about the child's gender. Now what's important here 
Are these random effects? Are you not? These are now residual terms because they're the part of the, the random effects of beta naught and beta one that are unexplained by gender. And in more advanced topics we could talk about, we can actually calculate the variability of these and the reduction in variance um, in the residuals as a measure of effect size, is how much of the variability are we explaining. But we won't do that here. All right, so we could expand this in any number of ways in the level one. We could have multiple, or excuse me, level two. We could have multiple predictors. We could have race and ethnicity. We could have some kind of parent psychopathology. We could have some characteristic of uh, a delinquent peer group membership, something like that. And we can build this in any way we want. Now, the general rules in level two is notice the subscript sub i. There's no t. Right? There's no notion of time here. Beta not sub i. It's unique to me, it's unique to you. So the kinds of covariates that go in the level two part of the model are called time invariant covariates. So they're measures that do not take on different values at each point in time. All right? So if we have biological sex, if we have country of origin, if we have birth order, things like that, those are invariant to time. But what about level one? All right, so we've got this kid, we have some developmental trajectory, maybe it's governed in some way, probabilistic way, by whether they're a boy or a girl, but they're still traveling through time, right? They're going to school, they have friend groups, things are happening in the household, they're, they're navigating life. Well, we can bring in what are called time-varying covariates. So instead of just a characteristic of the kid that would reside at level two, we can have a time-varying covariate that would influence the time-specific aggressive behavior above and beyond the influence of the trajectory. So to see this, let's go back to my earlier plot where we have age and aggressive behavior as before. And so imagine this is my trajectory, all right? So I have beta naught sub i and I have the slope of beta one sub i. But remember, this is trajectory is smoothed over those repeated observations that kind of might bounce around the trajectory. And these, the distance of each actual observation from the underlying trajectory, that's the residual, right? That's literally r sub ti right there, all right? This is the residual, r sub ti. What we want to do is we want to bring in a set of covariates that are unique to each age and we're trying to map on to see if above and beyond the underlying trajectory there's an added poke or a prod if it pushes up a little higher than you would expect if it pulls it down a little lower. So maybe at each age you assess the quality of the teacher that I have in the classroom. All right? and higher quality teachers might be associated in a year that I had a really good teacher, my aggressive behavior might be lower. In a year that I had maybe a less qualified teacher, a less effective disciplinarian at school, in that year, my aggressive behavior might be higher. And so here we could, I'll just slip it in here, is we could have, say, plus beta 2 sub i, right, because it's another predictor, beta 2 sub i, some teacher quality, but notice it's t sub i. So it's unique to time t for individual i. At level 2, it's only unique to the individual, not to the time period. And so you can start to see we can build our models in a whole variety of interesting ways because we can have multiple covariates at level two, we can have multiple covariates at level one, we can allow covariates to interact within level, we can allow covariates to interact across level, and there are a whole variety of ways that we can provide some very powerful tests to increasingly complicated um, hypotheses that we might be, uh, you know, have derived from theory and want to evaluate using our repeated measures data. So that's the core of the standard growth model in the multi-level. Now, where the multi-level model is uniquely positioned to expand in ways that some other techniques are not, is notice the natural structure of the data, right? We have level one with the aggressive behavior. We have level two where that's nested within kid is we can't help ourselves but say, well, what about level three, right? 
is what if we have repeated measures nested within child, but say we had multiple children within a classroom, all right? So level one is the nesting is in age, level two, we have child, and then level three is class. All right. So now I'm not going to go back and redo all the, the notation, but what we would start to do is add a subscript to have time point T for kid I in class J. So we now have another uh, uh, nesting. And then everything would expand. Now instead of me just being beta not sub i, it would be me, beta not sub i, nested within class J. Maybe you and I are in the same class, but we have a whole lot of other kids who share other classrooms. So we have beta 1 J, notice we throw the J's on it. Now as we move to level 2, we lose the time, right? Because now we're moving to the child level, but these are all now varying as a function of J. So we can throw J's on all of these, all right? And we can then, and this is where I won't do all of this because it starts getting pretty detailed, but now we can start to write equations for these. Gamma not not J, gamma one not J, and we can build a whole set of equations for classroom. So we could look at characteristics that are time varying within kid, we can look at characteristics of the child, but then we could build a classroom model to look at classroom size or, or some characteristics of, of the school, the principal's philosophy, things like that. And we could write whole equations for that, and we can just keep going. I was involved myself in a really interesting project with colleagues, um, uh, Patrick Sweeney, who was at West Point at the time, and he was studying leadership and trust and influence in time nested within soldier who was nested within squad who was nested within platoon who was nested within company we had five levels of analyses and trying to look at all of the nesting structures and the influences within and across level it was a fascinating application and so this is a, a very brief review of how we would estimate a growth model within a multi-level framework and we simply you see the general rules and the patterns as we write the equation at level one what we believe to vary randomly over the next level of units we write an equation for that if we don't have higher order nesting we just stop at level two but if we do have additional nesting we write whatever we believe to vary randomly over the next level three and we can just keep going as long as you uh, have the data to support that and there are many expansions, there are many details that I haven't talked about, but this is just in a nutshell how we can apply the multi-level model to estimating these growth models in practice. So I hope that's been of some use and thank you very much for your time.